It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Eric Jones uh, here this afternoon. Um, he is professor at John Hopkins University, or the Bologna Center of bon Hop John Hopkins University uh, in Bologna. He's a resident professor in European studies, and I should say that actually uh, Eric knows us, knows CEU, from having been here at some point in the university's development uh, teaching here. Um, he also has been um, teaching at the University of Nottingham, and he has been uh, affiliated for a couple of years with the uh, famous or Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. Um, I don't want to uh, say more, but just hand over to you and give you the floor to lead into uh, a topic which has been mentioned or touched on several times already uh, during the conference. So I think it's all the more important and quite timely, actually, uh, to have you here, as you have published in that field quite a lot uh, to round up uh, our thoughts and discussions on that particular topic. Over to you, Eric. Thanks for being here. Super. Thanks a lot. I'm going to talk from over here. I hope you can hear me. Uh, my, my accent is a little bit weird uh, because I come from Texas. So if you don't understand me, just raise your hand and I'll try to neutralize a little bit of my native speech patterns. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back here at the Central European University. I was part of the team that was hired into the European Studies program that transformed the European Studies program into international relations in European studies. And, and, and so it's fun to come back and, and see how well that program is doing, to see how well the CEU is doing. Uh, I was at, uh, in Prague, actually, uh, as part of the last group that, that worked and operated in Prague. And then I came and was part of the first group that moved into this building. So it's, it, it's amazing how much has changed. The only thing that hasn't changed is that the students are still outstanding. I mean, we always had the best students I've ever worked with, and, and from what Uwe tells me uh, and Nick tells me, that's, that's still true today. So it's a, it's a great privilege to speak with you. The talk that I'm going to give you today is a, is a very topical talk. I'm not going to tell you about great movements in the literature. I, I'm, I'm not that good. Uh, and, and so what I'm going to do is give you a topical talk, but, but it's a topical talk about the failure of analysis. Professor Wiener said, uh, you know, look, I don't, uh, I don't like to get involved in politics because I analyze politics. I feel that way about bond markets. <laughs> I don't like to get involved in bond markets, not because I analyze them, but because <laughs> markets can be irrational longer than I can be solvent. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and the problem that I face right now is that the German government is actually I irrational far longer than, than many countries can remain solvent. And, and, and we're struggling to try to figure out why they're doing that. And certainly the advice I gave over the last 18 months to investment uh, fund managers uh, was all wrong, right? Which is why this is the Soros University and not the Jones University. Um, <laughs> the argument that I'm going to make is, is actually fairly straightforward. It says that the, the crisis that we're experiencing right now is not the result of profligacy. It's not about corruption, laziness, or indigence on the part of all these, these peripheral countries. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with market competitiveness, so we can talk to economists and economists will go, well, they have to have their competitiveness improved, but it's just not about that. Uh, and, and in fact, it, although it was caused by economic and monetary union, that doesn't mean monetary union was a bad idea. Monetary union was a great idea. There were other bad ideas that caused this crisis as well, and so just because something caused it doesn't mean we should attach a normative value to the causal role. Uh, and, and finally, if we get rid of the single currency, if we get rid of the euro, life is going to be much, 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 much worse, right, than it is today. Now, the way I'm going to do this, because I'm supposed to do this in like 20 minutes and you guys are all really tired and we're going to listen to Solana, so we've got to get our energy back, uh, is a four-part structure that goes like this. Um, we're going to talk about anomalies and the conventional view of competitiveness within the eurozone. Then we'll, then we'll extend those anomalies to competitiveness outside the eurozone. Uh, we'll try to provide an alternative explanation. So we'll explain everything that the conventional view explains and then more, right? Uh, and, and then we'll conclude with some lessons that should have been learned and have not. And, and in other words, uh, I'm going to break my cardinal rule and give you my solution to the current crisis. And if you read the New York Times, you'll find that my solution is getting traction uh, in the real world today. So the next crisis may be the Jones crisis after all. The conventional view goes like this. Look, um, the pigs, we like to call them pigs because that makes them easier to denigrate. Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain are, are lazy, 
irresponsible, uh, corrupt, and uncompetitive, right? And, and not only that, but, but they took advantage uh, of the more sort of ant-like uh, responsible behavior of the North, uh, and they borrowed excessively, uh, which means well beyond their meaning, uh, their ability to repay, right? When you're going to use this term excessively, you've really got to define it. Uh, they spent the money on consumption rather than investment, right? Uh, and, and now the chickens have come home to roost, right? They get what they deserve. This is the conventional view, right? Particularly in Die Bildzeitung, but, but that's okay. <laughs> now, the anomalies go like this. Um, first, there's a methodological point here. We're trying to explain variation with a constant, right? I live in Southern Europe. They've always been this way, right? Uh, and, and, and since they've always been this way, why are we having a crisis now, right? We can't explain the timing of the crisis. With, with sort of cultural explanations of Southern European behavior. As a matter of fact, if we look in the data, we'll find that the Greeks work longer during their life than the Germans. They work more hours a year than the Germans, and they work like hell, right? Why is that? Well, because they don't get paid a lot. When you don't get paid a lot, you gotta make up for it with hours worked. And in the article that I published in Survival last spring, I went back through the data to show that, that in fact they're not lazy, corrupt, and all this other stuff. I mean, maybe they are, but, but not really that bad, and certainly it's not the cause. Uh, as for competitiveness, and this is the thing that we really wanna focus on, the numbers sort of stack up, but they don't really stack up. And there are a series of questions up there that I want you to consider, and I want you to hold the answers to those questions in your mind as we go through the data, okay? So I'll give you two seconds to answer the question. I'm not going to read the questions, but I'll give you two seconds to answer the questions in your mind, and then we'll go to the data. Data number one, real effective exchange rates. Look at this. Those pigs, their real effective exchange rates appreciated dramatically. Germany, all that competitiveness, this must be the source of the problem. What would we expect it to show up as? Oh my god, look at these current account deficits. They lost competitiveness. Now they have a huge current account deficit. Germany gained competitiveness. Look at its current account surplus. This is what the conventional wisdom points to. The data seems very clear on this, right? Very clear. The problem is that the correlations are off. Let me give you an example, right? We could tell the story about Germany. In the 1990s, Germany lost competitiveness, right? An appreciation of its real effective exchange rate. And it experienced a current account deficit in the 1990s, right? In the, in the 2000s, it gained competitiveness and it got a current account surplus. That fits. That fits. Let's look at Greece, though. In Greece lost a lot of competitiveness in the 1990s, about 17% relative to the EU15, and it had a current account surplus. In the 2000s, it lost a lot less of its competitiveness and its current account surplus or deficit quadrupled, right? How does that make sense? Why is its current account deficit getting worse as it's getting a better control over its competitive situation? And it's not just Greece. Ireland is a traditional story, but look at Spain. Spain got a current account deficit when it gained competitiveness, and it got a current account deficit when it lost competitiveness. In Portugal, also, just like Greece, marshaled control over its loss of competitiveness, and it was rewarded with the same current account deficit. So there's something not right in the correlations. I'm not saying that this is a silver bullet proof positive, but there's just something not right. <clears throat> Now let's think about manufacturing employment. This is what I find really interesting. This is Germany, right? So Germany, over the period, loses 30% of its manufacturing employment. And this is the pigs. If they were losing so much competitiveness and if they were suffering so much, how come they keep their manufacturing jobs? Maybe that's why they're so uncompetitive, because they don't ever fire anybody. But there's something really odd there, right? That they kept their manufacturing employment while Germany shed its. Now let's look at their market shares. This is the pigs. This is Germany. Germany lost a lot of market share in the 1990s, and it recovered some of it more recently. But the pigs, but their market share is doing better since 1991 than Germany. So they've kept all their manufacturing employment. They've kept more of their market share. How can competitiveness be at the heart of the story? It just doesn't really add up, right? I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's weird. What about outside the Eurozone? Well, we could do the same kind of analysis outside the Eurozone to see if the competitiveness story actually works differently when you don't have that slavish devotion to a single currency and that evil central bank. Well, what we can see is that they have real effective exchange rate movements that are somewhat different, right? Denmark sees a horrible worsening of its real effective exchange rate. Why? Because the Danes pretend to be outside the Eurozone. They just pretend. They track perfectly the monetary policy decisions of the German, uh, of the German <laughs> European Central Bank. Um, and, 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 and doing that, they've, they've suffered horribly a, a loss of competitiveness. The Swedes, they are not so slavishly devoted to the ECB. They tend to let their currency float a little bit. 
And the Brits, they're crazy, man. They, they, they let their currency do whatever it wants, right? Well, what happens on the current account? Well, what's interesting is the Danes actually get a surplus, right? What? They were, they were the ones who lost competitiveness. Swede gets a really big surplus, right? But look at the United Kingdom. They gain competitiveness and they run a deficit. It's kind of weird. And if we look at the correlations over time, what we'll find is that all three countries have very different relationships between movements in the real effective exchange rate and movements in the current account position. So if we're going to use the big magic wand of competitiveness to explain this story, it, it, it has to be nuanced. There has to be something more going on there, right? Let's look at their manufacturing performance. It's so good to be outside the Eurozone because if you're <coughs> outside the Eurozone, you can see all of your manufacturing employment disappear very quickly, right? You don't have to wait a long time. As a matter of fact, at the end of this period in 2007, the Financial Times said, isn't exchange rate volatility great? It's finally helped us get rid of our outmoded manufacturing industry. And now we can specialize, this is 2007, we can specialize in high value added financial services. I think that was a brilliant move, right? Um, but, but that brilliant move cost a lot of manufacturing jobs, and it pushed a lot of people into the public sector who now have to be fired from the public sector so that we can cure the public sector deficits. As for their market shares, the neat thing is, is that when you lose your manufacturing uh, employment, you lose your market share at the same time, right? So you can just take all that old, outmoded export stuff, right, and get rid of it, which strikes me as a bit odd. If we're going to tell the competitive in the story and say it's so great to be outside the euro, um, then, then why are we losing manufacturing jobs and market share both at the same time? Well, maybe what we need to do is to tell an alternative story that includes or implicates both countries inside the Eurozone and countries outside the Eurozone in the same processes. And the processes that we're going <coughs> to implicate them in are processes that we'll understand in a four-step strategy. It goes like this. First, common sense, right? We're going to look at market power and common sense. Second, market processes, specifically nominal interest rate convergence. And we're going to look at this through the lens of what's called Granger causality, which is that something has to happen before the thing that's caused, for the thing that's caused to be described as the effect, right? The effect, uh, or the cause doesn't come after the effect. I, n I never say that right. But anyway, y you get the basic idea. You'll see it in the picture. Um, then we're going to talk a bit about macroeconomic imbalances uh, and, and competitiveness divergence, as the, uh, not as the cause, uh, but as the effect uh, of the processes that we're introducing, right? It goes like this. Um, when we're talking about the Greeks borrowing too much, it's kind of weird, right? Because normally in market relations, you say that the person who's willing to pay more and more is more powerful than the person who expects to be paid more and more, right? That's right, isn't it? So the, the person who's willing to pay more and more is more powerful than the person who expects to pay less and less in a market relationship. And, and, and yet that's precisely the relationship between Germany and Greece, right? Because throughout the 1990s and the 2000s, the Germans were willing to pay more and more for Greek bonds, and the Greeks expected to pay less and less to borrow money from Germany. The Germans pay more and more. The Greeks expect to pay less and less, right? Who has the market power in this relationship? Is it Germany, who's willing to pay more and more? Or is it Greece, who expects to pay less and less? Because if we're going to believe that it's because the Greeks somehow irrationally borrowed too much, we have to explain why they were able to do that, paying less and less. Now, the, the story is a story about nominal interest rate convergence. And what happened is my friends in the bond market looked at the opportunity that was presented by the elimination of exchange rate risk to move money from one country to the next, selling expensive German bonds to buy cheap Greek, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian bonds, right? Now, what that meant is that German bonds very marginally began to yield more, right? Because the price of these bonds went down slightly as there was selling pressure in the market. But German bond markets are huge relative to these bond markets in the pigs. And in the pigs, in Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain, prices in the bond market went up as there was an increase in demand, which meant that the yield went down. So the yield between German bonds and pigs' bonds converged. That's what this line shows. It shows the standard deviation uh, across national bond yields. Uh, and, and the standard deviation across national bond yields drops down to well below 40 basis points. In other words, less than four-tenths of a percent in interest. 
And, and that's because the prices converged so tightly and stayed convergent, right? Now, what this means is that the German investors are investing ever-increasing amounts of money in Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. And what are the Portuguese, the Italians, the Irish, the Greece, and the Spaniards going to do with this money, right? Well, I don't know about you, but when I borrow money, I spend it, right? Um, I, I might spend it on investment, but, but, but certainly I'm going to spend it on something. And the problem is that what I'm producing is not increasing in line with the amount of money that I'm receiving. And, and so that something that I'm going to spend it on comes from abroad. By the same token, when the Germans stop spending money at home and send the money abroad, they've got to do something with all that stuff they're producing, right? They don't have the money for it anymore because they've sent the money abroad. Uh, and, and so the goods from Germany have to go abroad. At the end of this nominal interest rate convergence story, what happens is Germany has to export goods to maintain the export of capital. And Greece, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and Ireland have to import goods right, so that they have something to use all that money that they're getting from the Germans with. And that's why, if you look at their current account balances with a lag, you see a variation in current account performance, right? As Germany moves ever increasingly into surplus and everybody else moves ever increasingly into deficit, right? Now, the driver in this story is financial. It's about bond markets and capital flows. It has nothing to do with competitiveness. And you can see the situation very clearly in Greece. I mean, look at this. This is the Greek nominal interest rate, left-hand uh, axis. Uh, and then this is the Greek current account deficit, right-hand axis. They start at this process roughly in balance, right? Uh, and, and they end with a deficit to GDP ratio of about 15%. Why? Because there's just tons and tons of money worth, I, I know you're going to guess this, worth about 15% of their GDP that's just flowed into their country, right? In 2007, the German surplus on current accounts was equal to 192.1 billion euros. In 2007, the collected deficit of Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain was 192.8 billion euros. Why was Germany investing in so much in these countries? Because then it didn't have to have any exchange rate risk. Because if you're a German pension fund and your fiduciary obligation to your pension savers is to get the highest yield with the same risk rating possible, you are obliged to buy the cheapest government securities that yield the highest, right, to maximize the return on your pension savings. They were obliged to do this, and they did it, and they did it very, very well, right? And so what happened? Well, what happened is that <coughs> Germany, as a consequence of this, actually saw a compression both of its prices and of its wages as a share of nominal GDP, what's called the real unit labor cost. Uh, and, and so what we're going to do here is decompose these movements in the real effective exchange rate into three different things. A nominal effective exchange rate, this is how your currency moves against everybody else's currency, trade weighted. A GDP price deflator, this is how your domestic prices move against everybody else's prices, trade weighted. And a real unit labor cost, this is how the ratio of nominal salaries to nominal GDP moves against your major trading partners, again, weighted. And what you see is, is that in the first period, in the 1990s, Germany had an appreciating nominal exchange rate but it was offset by collapsing domestic prices, right? And yet, because of rapid nominal wage convergence that took place when they unified Germany, it had an increasing wage bill. Once they shook out this whole rapid nominal wage convergence from East Germany, they got an even further compression of prices relative to everybody else uh, and a compression of wages relative to everyone else. Now look at what happens to Greece. Greece actually used to rely on devaluations, right, depreciations, but it never offset the relatively high rate of inflation. They always lost competitiveness as a result, but, but they did get control over their inflation. It's just that when their prices increased only marginally relative to Germany, Germany's prices were falling relative to everybody else. Uh, and look at these real unit labor costs. It's not like the, Ger the Greeks were out there spending money on wages. Their wages as a share of nominal GDP remains constant in the second period, right? 
And, and, and we could tell similar stories with respect to Ireland. Ireland, you have to understand, you know, they give up 4% relative to their trading partners because in the run-up to Economic and Monetary Union, they had a social pact that compressed wages hugely so that they could go in at a favorable exchange rate, right? Uh, and, and we could tell a story about Portugal, and, and again, you see their wages as a share of nominal GDP is flat in the 1990s. They get control over the relative inflation costs, but nobody can get control to match this incredible compression that's going on in Germany. Uh, and, and we could tell the story with Italy. Italy had its own social pacts in the run-up to economic and monetary union, which is why it had uh, a real effective exchange rate competitiveness gain, right? Uh, and it surrendered some of that, but it still ends up at a better competitive position now than it was in 1991. Uh, and, and we could tell a similar story with Spain, but look at Spain. The Spaniards, who are next on the chopping block after Portugal, uh, uh, have had a real compression in their real unit labor costs uh, during the 2000s, right? And, th and this is their competitiveness problem. Now, when is this a problem? Um, actually, you know, we're, we're talking about huge financial flows from traditionally low interest rate areas to traditionally high interest rate areas. And that's what money is supposed to do. It's supposed to go from places where there are few investment opportunities, low yield, to places where there are, are lots of investment opportunities, high yield. I had an investment banker say, well, you know, they probably just spent the money on, you know, consumption. Actually, if you look at the, the contribution of gross fixed capital formation to real income, right, real income growth in Greece, over the period that I'm looking at, 2000 to 2007, Greece uh, had gross fixed capital formation contribute 8% of its real growth, not 8 eight percentage points of real GDP growth, right? Germany, over the same period, had gross fixed capital formation contribute 0.8 percentage points to its real growth over the period. So they're, they're actually using the money for investment, okay? They're using the money for investment, and that's what they're supposed to do, and it would work if we could just do this for several decades, which is what Vitor Gaspar, the first research director at the European Central Bank argues, if we use uh, computational general equilibrium models, right, that's a really hard thing to say if you come from Texas, um, if, if we use those models, what we can show is that the adjustment process takes about seven decades, right? So you have to be patient. Germans are fam famous for their patient capital. We have to be patient. You've got to leave your money out there. And since Germany is going to have its real demographic problems in, in about the same time period, it would make sense for them to leave the money out there. And the only problem is in the short run. Because if the short run, if your bond markets get spooked, if your banks think they're going to lose part of their principal, if, if you go out and tell them, uh, you know what, we, we want you to bail in and we're going to give you a haircut, or, or before that, if you say something really crazy like, we're only going to save these people if they don't have access to market resources, which means that you and the private sector have already experienced all your losses. If you say those things, then you scare the hell out of your banking community, and they take their money out now, right? And if they take their money out now, how is Greece supposed to pay for the 15% current account deficit that it's been running, right? It has to do what Latvia did, which was basically go through a huge, sudden compression of gross domestic activity. Now, the reason I say this is, is to, to explain to you that it's all about spooking the bond market. It's not an economic story. It's a political story. Now, everybody says in this political story, they go, oh, Greece announced that it was going to have to revise its deficit figures, and so then the bond markets got spooked and went into a rout, right? Greece suddenly said, we've actually borrowed more than we said we did, right? Well, you know, come on, these guys are bond markets. They know exactly how much you've borrowed, right? And, and, and not only that, but in January 2009, Standard & Poor's announced to the world, we're going to downgrade Greece because we don't understand their deficit figures and we assume they have a larger deficit than they're saying. Uh, the IMF went and for its Article 4 consultations in June of 2009 and said, you know what, we think Greece has a problem with its deficit figures. On the cover sheet of its Article 4 consultations document, which was published in August of 2009, the IMF says Greece has a problem with its deficit figures and we assume their deficit is much larger than they say it is. And so when Greece announced that it had these deficits that were much larger than people thought, what happened in the bond market? Nothing. Why would anything happen? They knew that. It was already priced in. They'd already priced it in, right? Why would they do anything? But, but, but then they were sitting around going, you know what? This may be a problem in the long run. We should check in with our politicians to make sure that the long run problem is solved, right? Because they keep doing this. This was an annual ritual for the Greeks to come out and say our deficit figures are actually 
underestimated. And, and, and so let's check in with the politicians. And in, in, in the run-up to the December European Council, the bond markets were checking in with the politicians. The politicians were saying, we're not going to talk about it. And the bond markets were like, no, no, no. I don't think you understand. We need reassurance, right? So just reassure us. Paris Steinbrook reassured them in February 2009. He said, you know what? We're never going to let anybody go bankrupt. And, and then just to make sure the message got across, he sent his assistant over to talk to Tony Barber at the FT. And his assistant said, we don't really care about the no bailout clause. We're going to bail them out. Because why would we let anybody go bankrupt? We just lose money, right? And that made sense. And, and that's why Greek yields were trading lower than Irish yields in the summer of 2009. But when the German government came out and said, we don't want to talk about it, the bond market said, oh my god, what do they know that we don't know? They don't want to talk about it, right? <laughs> and so after this, the bond markets got a little bit spooked, and the new incoming president of the European Council said, you know what, maybe we should talk about it. And he called for a special summit, and they go, oh. He wants to talk about it. We know they know something we don't know. Uh, and so the bond markets really freaked out while they were waiting to figure out what von Rumpau knew that they didn't know, right? Uh, and then they had the meeting, and they discovered that, in fact, the, the Europeans said, well, we'll be solidarity with them. And they were like, well, OK, but what does that mean, solidarity, solidarity? Is it a Polish trade union? What is that, right? <laughs> Uh, and, and, and then as they sort of debated what this meant, they said, well, we'll wait till the March European Council Summit to find out what solidarity means. And, and at the March European Council Summit, they discovered that what solidarity means is ultima ratio, right? We'll wait until you no longer have market access to bail you out. And the bond market said, but we are the market that they're supposed to access. Every bond auction that Greece had was five times oversubscribed in this period. Every single one. They got lots of money from the market. But once they realized that they were going to have to cut Greece out of the market, the bond yields collapsed, right? Or rather, the prices collapsed and the yields went right to the roof, which is why we had this incredibly expensive problem. And, and, and you know, you would think that they would figure this out, but they didn't. They went back and did the same thing again, right, with Ireland this time. And they, they announced, they said, look, you know, well, we're going to give the private sector a haircut. And the private sector goes, OK, do you understand what it means when we price that in? Right? You know what pricing in means. Pricing in means selling. Right? And so they've been selling. And, and, and as they've been selling, the banks have been taking losses. Because you know who uses sovereign debt? are banks. They use them for their treasury operations. They sit on mountains of this stuff. And as they're writing this stuff down, their capital base is being eroded at precisely the same time that we're telling them to increase their capital base. Not only that, but they know that this is happening to each other as well. So interbank markets are freezing up, and countries are being cut out, particularly those countries where the banking system are most dependent on using the sovereign debt that's most exposed for their treasury operations. That's why Portugal can't get money in the interbank market today. right? Now, would it be better if we were outside the Eurozone? Absolutely not. Look at what's going on with exchange rates. Really think that the European economy would be healthy right now if this was going on to exchange rates within Europe, right? These are the exchange rates against the Euro, but it could be going on within Europe. And if it were going on within Europe, we'd see a huge disruption in the flow of trade, right? So we don't want this. This is pre-crisis. This is post-crisis. The most important thing to keep in mind is the corkscrew as these exchange rates move places, right? Because you source in one market to sell in another, and they've reversed those relationships and destroyed significant industries as a result. So where do we go from here? Well, the first thing that we need to do is to recognize that before we deal with problems of moral hazard, because there are legitimate concerns about moral hazard, we have to start with problems of market confidence. That means we have to emphasize solvency, right? Everybody has to be able to pay everybody else, right? even if that means we have to give them the money to do so. This is why the ECB is stepping into the market right now. Then we have to restore liquidity by reassuring the banks that the interbank market is going to continue to function. In other words, they're not going to face the kind of counterparty risk that they faced around the Lehman Brothers crisis. Right? Now, once we provide all that reassurance, once we get things calmed down, then we can start introducing long-run measures to stabilize the market. Uh, we can promote macroeconomic rebalancing. It, look, if the Germans don't want to be the patient capital that funds the economic development of Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, Spain, that's fine. But then they should stop sending them the money, right? And, and that means that Germany is going to have to figure out where to invest that money at home. Ask yourself, aren't there roads and schools and hospitals in Germany that could use a little bit of paint, right? Because if they would just fix those things up, they could invest the money at home, 
right? And their savings investment would come into balance and they wouldn't have a current account surplus. Um, and, and, and the other thing is we've got to introduce euro bonds, and this is the proposal that I was telling you about. I can go into how this euro bond proposal works, but the basic idea of the euro bond proposal is to give states limited drawing rights, 60% of your GDP, so that you can go into the market for common bonds, limit the amount of rollover that you experience at any one time, finance yourself responsibly, and then pay a premium on any excessive borrowing that you undertake. And if you pay a premium on excessive borrowing, then you won't borrow excessively. And we don't have to worry about a stability and growth pact anymore because we'll have real market discipline on the fiscal side of the equation. Anyway, I talked too long. Thanks a lot.